So title for today is Do Not Fear. Uh, so some of you are probably wondering, well, he's going off to youth camp. Who's he preaching to, himself or to me? Uh, a little, little, little bit of both. <laughs> I'll be honest. <laughs> it, this, this very much preaches to my own soul. Uh, let's, let's pray. Father, I, uh, I pray as we get into your word and we begin to study the heart of fear and understanding what it's about and how the Bible speaks about fear and against it. God, help us to um, take away uh, from this message that this morning, Lord, how we are to respond and how we are to overcome these fears. Uh, God, help us to just hear your words and not my words. God, inspire us through your scripture. And I pray that we'd be changed for it. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I think fear is a fun topic. Uh, I don't know if you've noticed in our culture that we kind of have a fascination with fear. We have TV shows called Fear Factor, or we have... Uh, you know, the defective detective, Adrian Monk. Some of you like that show. I, I love that show. You know, we, we make, we almost make comedy out of phobias. You know, when you watch a show like that, the guy's afraid of milk. He's afraid of heights. He's afraid of all kinds of weird things. So fear. What's interesting about fear is actually the most commanded phrase in the Bible. It's commanded 365 times. That's one do not fear for every day of the year. So they have books on Do Not Fear out in the library. If you want to go to Christian books, you could find one of these. And you could read one of these Do Not Fear phrases every single day of the year. Now, I've read through every single one of them, and I contemplated very hard how could I fit all of them into a sermon, and I realized I can't. Uh, I have to boil this down somehow and, and get to what's the greatest Do Not Fear statement. Where, where, where would I turn to find this? And I searched the scriptures, and I went back and forth, and I started discovering certain repeating patterns. You know, whenever the Bible says something, to me, when it says it once, okay, pay attention. Say it twice, pay attention. Say it 365 times, you really better pay attention. It's kind of like when I'm trying to tell my kids to learn something, I repeat myself over and over. So the same kind of, I, I believe that's the same kind of thing when we open God's Word. There's repetitiveness. Now, does that make this the greatest command? It has to be, right? This has to be the greatest command ever if God repeated it so many times. Well, there was an occasion when Jesus was being asked by a teacher, or being asked by somebody, he says, uh, what is the greatest command? And it's not, do not be afraid. This is what it says in Matthew. It says, uh, teacher, which is the greatest command in the law? And Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest command. It's not, do not fear, to my surprise. And he says, he even tells us what the second is. He says, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the laws and the prophets hang on these two commands. Everything is in the, in the bounds of these two commands. Now, breaking this down logically, I, you know, I'm a logic person. I want to see everything in math. So I try to make everything into a, a formula. Basically, what he says in there, he says, love God and love others. Those are the two commands. Love God and love others. And if you think about it logically, if you love God, you're going to do all the other commands that have to do with God, like keeping the Sabbath holy and no other gods before me. If you love God, you're not going to do those other commands. So it makes sense that he says, hey, these commands hang on these two principles. Same thing with loving others. He says, you're not going to lie to others. If you really love others, you're not going to lie to them. You're not going to steal or murder or covet or do those things. But to be quite honest, you really could get away with just love God, couldn't you? Couldn't you just take that second command away? Why would you do those other things if you loved God? If you love God, you're not going to lie to people. So logically, this is the greatest command. Boy, he hit a home run when he did this. Good thing he's God. He knows what he's talking about. So it's within this context that I'm going to try to frame do not fear. God already told us what the greatest command is. But do not fear is commanded over and over. The two have to come together somehow, right? There has to be a connection between these two things. Well, I think there is a very strong connection, and I think, I hope I spell it out for you as we, as we dig into this, and you can see the connection that loving God has a lot to do with do not be afraid. That command is framed in that context of loving God. So, what is fear? We read a little bit already this morning with the kids. Uh, there is no fear in love. Well, we know this. Fear does not have anything to do with love. In fact, fear is the opposite of love. This is quite contrary to what most of us probably think. We, when we start thinking about fears and overcoming fears, we think bravery, courage, all those kind of things. Love is not one of those things that we automatically think of when we think of our, our fears. If we're worried, we don't think to ourselves, oh, I need to just love more. 
That's not what comes into our mindset. But yet in the Bible it says here, there is no fear in love. If you want to conquer fear, love has a lot to do with it. And it says here, but perfect love drives out fear. So what is love? If fear is bad and we don't like fear, what is love? Well, if you back up in that same passage, 1 John 4, 8, it says this, whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. God is love. So here's a, here's a math formula in this. There's a lot of math going on here. First off, God equals love. Same thing. One and the same. You think love, you think God. Here's the other part of that formula. Love is greater than fear. Certainly God is greater than anything in the universe, right? God is love. God is greater than any fear that we could ever, ever imagine. So the question is, why are we afraid of anything? If that's the formula, that's a pretty simple formula. God is love. God is bigger than fear. So why am I afraid of anything? Well, it's complicated, isn't it? Fears and worries. God doesn't really understand all my fears and worries, does he? I mean, he can't just say, hey, I love you, and that's enough, is it? Well, let's find out. So what's love got to do with it? <laughs> I, I, couldn't help, I couldn't help with that in there. <laughs> Who started thinking of this woman? <laughs> Don't lie. That was your first thought when I said that, wasn't it? <laughs> all right. Here's what our first thought should be when we think of what's love got to do with it. 1 Corinthians, the love chapter. If you've never understood what love is about, read 1 Corinthians 13. You break my heart if you have not read it. You need to read 1 Corinthians 13. It says this, after it goes on and talking about all these different things that love is, it finishes with this phrase. He says, and now these, these, these three things remain, faith, hope, and love. But notice this, but the greatest of these is love. We've been talking about greats, greatest commandment in the Bible. Well, it's not do not fear, it's love God. Why? Because the greatest of these is love. Because God is great. The greatest is love. So let's sum up what we heard so far. So God says do not fear 365 times. Enough for us to hear it every day. God, His greatest commandment is to love Him. In John it says perfect love has no fear. So we should not, I'll get to that in a minute. God is love. Love is greater than everything. So the question I have is number three there. Perfect love has no fear. Well, what is perfect love then? How do you express perfect love? If perfect love drives out fear, and we don't want any fear in our lives, what is perfect love? Well, I don't know of any other way to describe perfect love than what God has done for us on the cross. What's love got to do with it? Well, greater love has no one than this, than to lay down his life for his friends. Notice the word greater love has no one than this. Great love, great. How many times does the word great show up in the Bible with the word love next to it? How many times do you see that? It's over and over and over again. Every time you see the phrase, do not be afraid, great and love surely follow somewhere in the passage. Some way, somehow. They all are always connected. Our fears and understanding this idea, this presence of God being great. God is loving. God has expressed it in such a way. So why do we still fear? Why are we afraid of anything? If God is love, why are we afraid of anything? Here's the painful answer to it. If you haven't already kind of got my, my tone here. Is God love in you? Here's the idea. If God is like the anti-fear, if God is in you, there should be no fear in you. So if God is in you, no fear, right? So how much is God in you is the question. Is God in you? If you're wrestling with fear, if you're struggling right now and you're saying to yourself, oh, my situations are so big, I have to ask you, is God in you? Are you like this chiseled heart here that you've got part you let God in part of your week. You come up Sunday and you say, like, yeah, God, you're in my heart Sunday. I can worship you here. But then you go to work the next day and you've got areas of your life that are hard. You've got walls built up on your heart. And you're saying, you know, God, you're okay most of the week, but I want to keep my worries and my fears to myself. I'm going to build up my heart in a way that you can't penetrate it. If 
you have fear in your life today, it's because you didn't let God penetrate your heart. It's very simple. You're not giving God control of those fears. You're not breaking down the walls of your heart. It's you that's not letting God in. You're a conduit for God's love. His all-consuming love wants to be all about your heart, all around it, all aspects of your heart, all areas of your life. If you have fear, that means he doesn't have it all. God's not in every aspect of you if you have fear in your life. Just a little bit of fear means there's no God there because perfect love drives out fear. So, what happened? Possibly, your love is misplaced. 1 John 2.15 says, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. Remember the question? Is God in you? That's the answer. If you want to answer your fears, or you want to get away from all the things that are bothering you, ask yourself, is God in me? Well, this verse here says, well, how does God become in you or not in you is the question. Is not in them. Well, if he's not in you, it means your love is probably misplaced. It means you're directed towards something that's not of him. It means that you're being distracted by something else in this world. That's what's going on. That's why, where fear gets to open the door on you. Because you've let something else in. You've let some other worry distract you. Well, how does this happen? Here's the equation. You plus God equals no fear. It's simple. It's just as plain as that. You minus God equals fear. Anytime you have an area of your life that does not have God in it, you are entering into a world of fear and worry, anxiety. All those things are going to press on you because God's not in it. God drives out that stuff if you put God in it. So, how do we fix this? How do we get things back on track? How do we get back to where we should be? I think the, the answer was back in the verse where we were talking about the greatest commandment. It says here, love the Lord your God with all your heart. Not a portion of your heart, all your heart. All your soul, all your mind. It's quite simple, right? We just, just give Him everything. So we worry less and we love more. That's the answer, right? There's a guy named Carl, Carl Dallenbach. He's a, uh, he's, he's, this is a, he studies the brain. And he studies human behavior. And he studies how we see things sometimes or we don't see things. Like how many of you, when you went to go buy your car, you thought it was like the only car out there? And then when you bought that car, all of a sudden you see that car everywhere. It's like that car didn't exist until you bought it. Well, the brain's wired this way. The brain is, is very hardwired this way. He's got an experiment. What do you see when you look at this picture? Does anybody see anything? Is it a map? It's confusing, isn't it? You don't see, there's something in there, but you can't see it. Does anybody, anybody see it? You can say it. If you, it's a cow. All right, you see it. All right, what if I superimpose this on there? Can you see it now? All right, what's funny about this, now if I go back to this picture, how can you not see the cow? Isn't that funny? You couldn't see that cow a minute ago. What happened? Your eyes weren't there. It's like the brain works funny that way. This is, uh, I, I discovered something when I was reading this guy's stuff. It's like, this is how fear works or how, how our relationship with God works. We set our sights on things and we don't see things. It's just like the car. No, it didn't exist until we bought it. It's just like our fears. It's like God, God's not big enough until we see him. God doesn't really, he's not really bigger than our fear until we truly see him. And you have to focus on him to see him. It's like this picture. You can't see it until you actually spend time on it and then look at it. And then all of a sudden everything comes into focus. It exists now. This is what the Bible says about seeing. He says, I lift my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, maker of heaven and earth. Our love is connected to our eyes. What we see and what we let into our world, into our eyes, is how we love this world. We spend a lot of time staring at things and consuming ourselves on things that really don't matter. How many of us have wasted hours in front of a TV or hours just doing stuff that just doesn't matter? If we spend time looking at the one who has made us, if we spend time looking at the mountains and looking at the God who created heaven and earth, what fear is there in that? 
How could we be afraid of anything? The picture is going to become real clear. Just like our brain, when we see something, we couldn't see it any other way. Once God enters into control, once God, once we start seeing him for who he really is, the guy that makes the mountaintops, there's nothing to be afraid of, is there? Everything becomes a lot smaller once you start seeing God the way you should see him. Once the picture becomes clear. Hebrews says, says it like this, Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. Remember what we said about perfect love drives out fear. Here it is, the word perfecter. It's all connected. Perfect faith comes from perfect love, the perfecter of our faith. Putting our eyes on Him will change that. But here's the, here's the other side of this. For joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne, uh, right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. So notice the heart again is being mentioned. In other words, you will not grow weary, you will not fear, you will not be anxious, you will not, you will not be stressed if you do these things. So the answer is simple, you plus God. Well, how do you do you plus God? Where are your eyes? What have you been looking at lately? What are you fixed on? Has your love been made perfect through Christ? Is God big enough? Is God bigger than the boogeyman for you? Or are you still seeing him as a small person? Charles Spurgeon, uh, the, he, he fills my life with devotions every day, it's great. Um, he is a dead theologian, but he, his words still speak from the grave for me. Um, this past week, as I was preparing for the sermon, he had this one little passage, uh, Isaiah 40, verse 9. Get thee up into the high mountain. He loves King James, too, so get thee. Um, and he, he started unpacking this, get thee up to the high mountain. And I started realizing this really fits into my sermon. You know, I started realizing, hey, mountaintops are something that God uses a lot of times to speak to people. And in fact, when you go through the scripture, you see a lot of times that big godly experiences usually happen around a mountain. They have the mount of, you know, it's the mountain of God kind of phrase. The, the idea is we are all kind of like climbing a mountain in our faith, aren't we? When I remember the first time I went hunting, and uh, it was, we got there in the middle of the night, and I couldn't see the mountain. All I could see was the silhouette of the mountain. And we're staying in a cabin at the bottom of the mountain. And I'm looking up. I'm like, that doesn't look like a mountain. All I can see is a silhouette. I'm like, that looks like a hill. I could probably get to the top of that in an hour. You know, it's funny how mountains and perspective are different. So morning came up and I, I was like, okay, it's a lot bigger. I could see it was rolling a little bit farther into the distance. But then that morning I had to hike up that mountain to go deer hunting. And man, I was tired. <laughs> I didn't even, I didn't get anywhere close to the top of the mountain. But I noticed as I started going up the mountain, like from what my vantage point was from that cabin, I couldn't see much. I could see maybe a stream. I could see the edge of the field. I couldn't see a whole lot. But as I started gaining ground and as I started going up the hill, I started seeing new perspectives. I started seeing out diff distances I couldn't see from down on the ground. A lot of times our faith is like that. You know, God is kind of small at the base of the mountain sometimes, or we don't quite realize how big he really is until we start climbing that mountain of God. It takes sometimes some steps of faith. It takes some new believing faith to just kind of go up that mountain and start getting new vantage points and seeing the world as God sees it from his perspective. As we start getting up to the top of that mountain, next thing you know, you can see everywhere, east, west, north, and south, the things that God can see from his vantage point that we can't see. There's, there's a message in this in the fact that we can't drive out fear unless we start climbing that mountain. We can't, get, we can't even possibly understand what God can see from his vantage point unless we start trying to know him more and trying to get up that mountain and fixing our eyes on his mountaintops and fixing our eyes on him. We'll never see what he sees unless we start climbing. So, climb the mountain. Jesus says it another way. This is a very simple phrase. He says, he was about to heal somebody, and Jesus told him, he says, don't be afraid, just believe. Just believe. How do you do that? Well, Paul, when he was in prison, he's gray-haired, he's in Rome. Things are not good for this guy. How does he say these words? He says this to Timothy. He says, this is why I'm suffering as I am. He says, yet this is, I, I, this is 
no cause for shame because I know, I know whom I believed. How does a guy get to that point where he's in prison and can say these words? My opinion is he's on top of the mountain. Paul climbed the mountain. Paul went through the, tr the struggles of getting up through these valleys and through these hills and he had a different vantage point from where he was sitting. Yeah, he was sitting in prison writing these words to Timothy. But how could he say this? How could he say with such confidence, I know whom I believed. It's because he took the steps. He, got, he drove out fear in his life. He wasn't afraid in that prison. He wasn't afraid when he had the chains wrapped around him. He says, I know whom I believed. How did he get there? Well, he climbed the mountain. Some of us are still sitting at the base of the mountain. Some of us don't see much from our vantage point. Some of us need to get up that mountain and start seeing things from his vantage point and start fearing less. Because a person who has a lot of fear is a person that doesn't really have God. You're really not connected. Because the Bible clearly says people who fear are people who don't know God. That's what John said in the earlier passage. People who fear don't know God. Isaiah 43 verses 1 to 2, or 3, some of my favorite passages of the Bible. It says, but now this is what the Lord says. He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, do not fear. I have redeemed you. I have redeemed you. Why don't we fear? Because he redeemed us. He purchased us. He says, I have summoned you by name. God knows you by name. He says, you are mine. He says, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers and you will not be swept over. Uh, uh, when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. Some of you feel like you're in a river now and the waters are just flowing around you, pushing you in every direction. Letting the fear drive you to make every decision. God says, you don't have to fear that way. I am with you. He says, I will keep those waters from passing over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Bottom line, biggest takeaway of almost every phrase, every time God says, don't be afraid, the tagline that usually follows has something to do with God's presence, has something to do with the fact that I am with you. You can't be afraid because I'm here. That's really what God's saying. He's like, are you really going to think that that's bigger than me? That's what God's saying. Every single time you say, I'm afraid, God's saying, really? I'm with you. How can you, how can you be afraid? That's what he's saying almost every single time. Fear not, I am with you. Isaiah 41.10. Jesus' last words, you remember the Great Commission. What did he say? I am with you always, is what Jesus said, just before he ascends into heaven. I am with you always. I am with you. That should be our driving factor. Every time we go out and we start getting afraid of something, we should say, you know what? God's with me. I'm all right. God's with me. He's got my back. But here's the, here's, here's the crux of God being with you. John 15, 5 to 6 says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Remember this being apart from God? You're subject to fear. You're subject to the, all those worries because you're apart from him. He says, if you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. You are a branch that is picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. So clearly there's a choice. This, if anything you heard this morning, there's a choice of whether or not God's with you. Sure, God is with you. God is everywhere, right? God is, God is all consuming. He is the creator of the universe. He's with you. But are you with him? That's the question. Not is he with us, but are you with him? Some of us can't say at the last minute, in the last ninth hour, oh, God is with me. I can't, I'm not going to be afraid. No, you've got to start that journey sooner. You've got to start at the base of the mountain. So when you get to that point in your life, when something feels like the waters are overtaking you, you already built up something. You already fixed your eyes on something. You remained in him. So when you get to that point where most people would crumble and fall apart because the fear and the shock of whatever circumstances they're under, you don't have to feel that way because you already built yourself up. That's why Paul can say when he's in prison, I know whom I believed. If you're struggling with fear and you're struggling with worries and all the things, 
And you can't say that because you're still at the base of the mountain. You got to start working up that mountain. You still, you've got to focus on him. You've got to remain in him. It's a choice. God's with you, yes. But you don't really see God for who he is until you spend more time with him. It's like being married in some respects. You, you don't really know your wife until you've really been married to her for a long time. After a while, you start seeing her for a much bigger person than she ever was. I know I love my wife way more now than I ever did when I first met her at the altar. I know her because she knows me better, and she still loves me anyhow, <laughs> surprisingly. God is a lot like this. You can't, you can't pretend to know God. You can't just fake it. You can't come in here on Sunday and say, well, I know God. I did the walk. I did the prayer. I got baptized. I got a little water on me. And then go around, and then you're consumed by every fear that's in your life. You're a worry wart. You can't pretend to know God. If, if your life is just filled with drama, and you're worried about all the things that are going around you, I have to question, is God in you? Or are you just faking it? You're just really good at the base of the mountain, faking what it might look like at the top of the mountain. You don't really know because you didn't walk up the mountain. You didn't actually take the steps to remain in God. You didn't actually follow through on the idea that God has here. God paid everything forward for you. You said, oh, sign me up, stamp my ticket, I want to go to heaven. But that's all you did. That's where you remain at the base of the mountain. You're just getting wafted around with the wind and the waters and the, and the worries of this life because God's only into you, only in a part of your heart and not all of you. Your life will change drastically when you start giving God every part of you. That fear that you feel now, it will be driven out. You have great assurance in God's promises. When he says, perfect love drives out fear, you have great assurance in that. You won't fear the next day when you start remaining in him. But the choice, again, it's yours. Yes, he's with you, but you've got to be with him. It's not going to happen by accident. It's a conscious decision you've got to make every single day not to fear and trust God that he is bigger than any circumstance that you would ever face. And let his perfect love consume you. Let his perfect love, you can't drive out fear yourself if you don't have the all-consuming love of God in you. You know, anytime fear is present, God is not present. Keep that in mind. Next time you try to love somebody to Christ, what are you afraid of? Don't hold back. You know, part of this sermon is a kind of a reflection on my own life is I never saw myself here. I never thought I'd be standing up telling you guys sermons or preaching to anybody. I never saw myself there. Maybe there's a place right now that you, you, you kind of say to yourself, well, I don't see myself doing that. Be weary. <laughs> because that's when God sometimes will put you. In fact, most of the time when God spoke to somebody and said, don't be afraid, it was usually about a circumstance that he wanted them to face, that they didn't quite see themselves doing. In fact, most of the time when he said, don't fear, it was something that we thought was impossible. No way God can use me that way. No way could he do this. That's where you need to start thinking. That's when you know you're starting to climb that mountain because he starts using you in ways that you never thought possible. That you thought there's no way he could do that with me. When you start saying that, that's the direction you need to start heading. Because that's probably the direction that he's going to use you the most because it's going to give him the most glory. When he can use you in a way you thought not possible, that's when you know you're on track. That's when God is taking you up the mountain. When you're doing unbelievable things that you never thought you'd do. So you have a choice this morning. Do you want to remain in him or do you want to stay at the base of the mountain? You know, some of us have never considered going beyond the base of the mountain. Today, I'm asking you, consider going somewhere you have never gone in your faith before. Consider taking a challenge. Consider going that direction you never thought God could take you in. Consider doing something bigger than you ever thought. Maybe it's just coming to VBS and just praying for kids. That's just the first step. Maybe you're not a big prayer person, you're, you, but this could be an opportunity for you to start refining that skill in the ministry. We need people to come here during VBS week just to sit and pray for our leaders. I understand not everybody's healthy and can, can get up and run around with these kids and some of you need steel-toed boots to do it. But you can still pray. 
you can still come and show up and, and pray. And we, we would love to have you in some way, some fashion, to use you. All right, let's pray this morning.